40 years later talking about this, yet here we are again. And in many ways, the current dialogue in the column is even 10 times worse. The chief case was just one incident, and now we're facing almost daily attacks and killings of Asians, and not just in the U.S. I think the same problem exists in Canada. I know that I have friends, in fact, a friend of mine who's a lawyer up in Vancouver has an 82-year-old mother. She feels unsafe walking around there because of the fact we've been assaults there as well. So for all of us who work in the case, we're very proud of the effort, and in fact, the two people in particular that are here today, Bowen, and also Jeff James, who's part of the original group that worked on it, and uh, Jeff's late wife, Nadi, was our director of the Mary Citizens of Justice back in the 1990s, and I thank you again for the service to that. But again, to have the standard today we have to talk about, it, it's just heartbreaking. I, I never think I'd be doing this now, and, and in many ways, the situation's gotten even worse by comparison. And it's not just people that are, that are from China, Japan, Korea, the Philippines. People that are from Muslim, Sikh, people that are Hindu, people from Bangladesh, Pakistan, India, throughout the South Asian region. We're all targets. We look to them. Who cares? We're Americans. And uh, I get these comments all the time, even at this point in life. They go, well, where are you from? I said, I'm from Detroit. I said, I was born and raised here. Well, where are you really from? And uh, quite honestly, it's a little bit uh, humiliating and also very uh, disgusting. And uh, quite frankly, in fact, I think Bo and I are uh, maybe two of the oldest families. Our two families have combined years of over 200 years in Detroit, our two families. And in fact, my grandfather came to Detroit back in 1914 and uh, actually got his first job in Detroit by going to Henry Ford's house. He actually went to the house and knocked on the door and it was Henry Ford. He got a job there. <laughs> Not that far ago with the eighth grade education. So. It's a long story. But today, we commemorate those victims, not just this machine, but all the hundreds and thousands of folks who have been attacked and killed over the last 40 years. It's a sad commentary that I have to stand here and talk about even now. But unfortunately, this is a miracle. We have the old right, the three percenters, and the uh, Proud Boys, QAnon, all these things that didn't exist 40 years ago are now driving the narrative. Politicians are making their, their, their Find their trades and, and, and elevate themselves because they're using the anti Asian rhetoric and the xenophobia as a way of raising their own profile. It's disgusting. One thing I always like to do a lot of Asians in the room, right? Obviously. I want to show that has anyone here felt like they've either been threatened or somehow questioned who they are simply by how you look? I had 10 the emails. Okay. There's quite a few folks here. So you understand the, the crisis. It's not going to go away anytime soon. But for all of us who work in the case, we take a lot of pride in the fact that we built a movement that has sustained the last 40 years. And all I can ask is each of you to dedicate yourselves, be educated, demand accountability by law enforcement, by public officials, unions, and also corporate people. These are all the elements that help drive the narrative against me. These are all things that drive the narrative. And I think it's important each of us be vigilant. Work with your school districts. Make sure they're engaged. Because right now, this anti anti movement is going to destroy the viability of Asian Pacific American studies. Tell your school boards, tell your local politicians, we're part of America, our story is important. Racism is part of American, American fabric, and we're victims of that. My mother spent two and a half years in a concentration camp out in Utah as a result of Japanese during World War II. So we all have a stake in this. And I ask all of you, dedicate yourselves, work hard, be part of the solution. Again, thank you again the opportunity. And again, we're very honored to have Ambassador Ty and Minister Lin here as our, our guest. And also, uh, to having um, a celebrity who I watch every morning on TV. <laughs> we have had. Thank you very much for being here as well. Uh, appreciate it. Thank you. Moderating tonight's discussion. Please join me in welcoming Kriyaman. How are we doing, guys? 
Uh, how amazing is it, is it that we're celebrating Asian American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander Heritage Month today? Yes. Thank you so much. I am really honored to be here. I think the bar has been set very low in the term celebrity, but thank you so much. You're a boost to the self-confidence. Uh, I had the distinct pleasure of being Canadian working in America, and when I was asked to participate in this event, I thought, well, hey, a thing or two about a thing or two when it comes to uh, Canada and the U.S. I've been in Detroit for nine years, uh, and I got my start uh, in Windsor, actually. And when I was living in Windsor as a, you know, a newbie in the business, I lived on the Detroit River, and I would look across, and I'd be like, how do I get there? And even though there was just a river separating Windsor from Detroit, it could have felt like a million miles. That goal just felt so insurmountable. Very fortunate and worked very hard, and I'm here today. And I think that uh, you know, as Jimmy was talking about, I think we've all experienced uh, hateful moments, racist moments. I also think there's a lot of teachable moments as well. And that's what I cling to. That's what I live to. That's what shows promise. I was in the grocery store this up the other day, and I was uh, walking out to my car, and a woman pulled up, and she just kind of yelled out of her window, where, where are you from? Where are you? And I, I looked at her, and I could tell she had a nice vibe. She just didn't really know how to ask it. And so I was like, oh, I know, my background's Indian. And she starts driving away, and she stops, and she reverses. And I was like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> what did I say? You know, what's the reaction going to be? And then she's like, should I have asked that that way? And I paused, and I looked at her, and I was like, thank you for even acknowledging. So I could tell it was coming from a nice place. But moments like this, those interactions one-on-one, -on -one, they can have a real difference. And I was like, you know, it'd be nice. I'm from here. But you can always kind of be like, maybe what's your background? If you're curious, it just opens the door to a nice conversation. And those are the moments that really show me how much progress we're making, even though it can feel that we are taking tremendous steps back. I want to thank everyone for being here today, especially our two honorable guests. Uh, it is truly a privilege to be in your presence, to think of the barriers that you have broken, the uh, cracks in the glass ceiling that you have created, uh, everything that you have overcome and you have achieved only help makes it that much easier for the next generation behind you to stand on your shoulders and maybe achieve even more. I think that's the goal for most people uh, when they achieve success at your level. Uh, they want to see others do that as well. So thank you so much for being here. Uh, what an incredible month of celebrating really a historic meeting of minds here in Southfield, Michigan. Uh, we have the top trade ambassador here as well as the honorable minister uh, joining forces between Canada and the U.S. Uh, I have the distinct pleasure of uh, bringing up both of these incredible women. I do want to start by introducing Ambassador Catherine Tai. She is the first Asian American woman and woman of color confirmed as a U.S. trade representative, making her the highest ranking official in discussions like this. One of the highest ranking members as well of our community in President Biden's cabinet. Can we please give her a round of applause? And co-chair of the President's Advisory Commission and Initiative on AANHPI. Please welcome up here Ambassador Catherine Tai. Thank you so much. And I have the distinct pleasure of bringing up Minister Mary Ng. She too is the first Asian Canadian woman of color trade minister from Canada. She is from Hong Kong, came to Canada as a little girl. And I think the immigrant story, being the first generation, that's something they don't talk about enough, you know? But when you see the second and third generation kids, you realize we've overcome a lot just to see you in that position, making the decisions that you're making, uh, your representation makes a true difference. A career public servant, two decades serving uh, as a member of the legislature uh, and part of Trudeau's coalition as well. So please, can you put your hands together for Minister Mary Ames? Together in the story of meeting of the mind, Ambassador Catherine Tai and Minister Mary Ng, we are going to get set up in just one second. See, look at the 
teamwork that's happening already. <laughs> Can we give them a round of applause? Thank you so much for being here, being with us today. May, of course, is Asian American and Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander Heritage Month here in the United States and Asian Heritage Month in Canada. This is a very special opportunity for me as a proud South Asian Canadian living and working here in the U.S. As you were both historic first in your respective roles as trade ministers, what does this month mean to the both of you? Wow, well, that's a big question. Um, let me just say how delighted I am to um, uh, be doing this event uh, with you, certainly, Priya, but uh, having uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Mary, here. Um, this is actually not the first May that we've spent together celebrating our heritages. Uh, on the um, uh, respective signs of the U.S. and Canada border. Um, last May, uh, Mary hosted me in Toronto. Um, and uh, this May, we were looking for an opportunity between Vancouver and Detroit, and uh, um, in both cases, right, um, right on that border. And this time, I went out and pulled her, pulled her down, or, or up, because I know we are, we are actually further north than um, Windsor itself. Um, it's a tremendous, um, it's a tremendous opportunity. So, uh, in my position, I wear two hats, as you've noted. Uh, I am both the United States Trade Representative, where I'm representing the interests of the entire United States in our trade policies, um, but also a co-chair of the White House Initiative and the President's Advisory Commission on Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders. Um, and that's a part of the work that I do that um, uh, I don't. Well, um, I don't get to talk about as much. And I'm looking out at the crowd, and I know that there are members of the trade press here that uh, I'm seeing for the first time in May, and, and what it takes to get the trade press to show up for an AA and an HPI Heritage Month celebration is um, to get an area to come. So I just want to say. Um, but uh, the, the work of the White House Initiative is incredibly important, and I will uh, use every opportunity I can boost um, the importance of the work and um, how much we are accomplishing. Um, in May of 2021, so that was two years ago, um, President Biden signed an executive order that reinvigorated the White House initiative, which uh, has been ongoing since uh, Norma Mineta uh, was the first chair of this, uh, of this body and institution. Uh, it covers 32 federal agencies. Each of the agency heads is asked to pony up uh, resources and people uh, to go through each of the agency's purviews, um, superpowers, resources, to identify what that agency can bring to the conversation and to the effort of improving access for the AA and HPI communities to equity, opportunity, and justice. And so really what this initiative is, is harnessing the power of the federal government in service of a community that very often feels overlooked or struggles with belonging. And especially over the course of these past several years, all of us have gone through, all of us, Americans, Canadians, all of us around the world, frankly, have gone through a lot of trauma and a lot of hardship before the AA and NHPI communities, and I know that Mary will be able to speak to the Canadian side um, of the experience, uh, I think that uh, we've experienced a, uh, an extra layer of feeling uh, very targeted um, and um, having to meet the challenge to stand up for ourselves and for each other, to assert our belonging, and what I'm really, really inspired by is um, the response to the call to action to take part in the civic space, in the political space, to engage with all of the tools and opportunities of our democracy to show um, our engagement and our connectivity with the United States and this larger community. So um, it's a tremendous privilege and uh, it's really uh, an honor to be able to do this here in Detroit uh, with you and with Mary. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much. Um, happy Asian Heritage Month. Happy Asian Heritage Month in uh, Canada. It's 21 years that we're celebrating this in, um, 
in, uh, in Canada and here in the U.S., Asian Pacific Islanders um, Month. And, uh, and I'm so thrilled to be here with uh, my good friend Catherine. And of course, uh, we were chatting a little bit about how wonderful it is that uh, we have a, uh, a Canadian who is here in America moderating this wonderful conversation. And, um, and um, I was actually with um, uh, yesterday in Vancouver, so the west coast of Canada, with 18 Chinatowns from both the US and Canada that have come together as part of Asian Heritage Month to look at how we can work together. But to your question um, about um, firsts and how one feels about that, um, for someone like me, running for public office was not the obvious thing. It really wasn't. And part of that, Catherine knows this because I've, you know, I've, we've talked about it, um, in my own family, and I would say in our community, I mean in the um, in the Chinese Canadian community, but I would say in East the East Asian community, so Korean Canadians, Japanese Canadians, uh, Filipino Canadians, just the broad spectrum. Um, the encouragement to run for public office, to engage, is not actually something that is um, nurtured as a young person. It just isn't. So you are nurtured to go to school, to go get good grades, to find yourself a profession, to work really hard, and to do really, really well. But if you're gonna spend a lot of time in civic engagement, like in political engagement, in volunteering, um, in civics, in politics, your parents might ask you, are you really sure you really should be spending that extra time and not studying? So you really are, so we, we, we kind of, you know, I don't want to stereotype this, but I'll sort of put it in sort of general terms. In, and, and I've talked to a lot of people um, in Canada about this, um, and, and, and this notion, which is, speaks to what Jim was talking about and what Catherine was just saying, um, running for office and putting your, seeing your name on a sign and taking that step, um, there's a statistic that says you have to ask a woman seven times before she says yes to run. If you're a racialized woman, it's more than seven. Because that was, that was me too. It really was. Um, but then I remember a very wise person, he happens to be the Prime Minister of Canada, that said, look, if you believe in everything I know you believe, which is that representation matters, that you bring a view and a perspective through lived experience that is your lived experience. And if you believe in the work that our government is trying to do, which is to really be inclusive and enable the diversity and the wonderful diversity that is Canada, then you gotta put that name on that placard and you've gotta go knocking on doors and you've gotta go and seek support. You've gotta go and fundraise you have to go and ask people um, in your community to engage and be a part of our wonderful democracy and to be at the table to begin to influence policies, choices. You know why we get to do that? Because we live in wonderful countries that are democratic countries that allow us to do this. So um, it's, it's, it's on the one hand an enormous sense of responsibility but it is the best thing you could ever do. And I'll end it with this. I didn't fully appreciate it until in those early days when I started knocking on doors. And um, I represent a riding in Canada called Markham Thornhill. It is a very diverse riding. I have wonderful constituents that come. There were, you know, over 70% of uh, my riding is not, um, you know, are, are, are visible minorities. Wonderful, you know, Asian community, Jewish community, you know, Muslim, multi faith and multicultural. I knocked on the door, and it, my by election was also in February, and there was a lot of snow, and you can relate to that here in Detroit. It was very cold, and this wonderful man came to the door and said, Oh man, hang on one second. I'm like, Okay, because of course I am knocking on the door and I am asking for his support. And so I'm waiting, and it's really cold. And he brings to the door his daughter and um, his wife. And you know what he said? He said, look, she's running to be 
our voice. And we want to support you. And he said to his daughter, you can do what she does too. Wow. That's the reason for being involved. And uh, so, like I said, on one hand, I feel a sense of responsibility. And I do believe you have to see her and him when it comes to visible minorities, minority groups. Um, but you have to see you, you have to see it to believe it is possible. And I believe with every fiber of my being, it is absolutely possible. And Catherine and I giving the getting the privilege to do the work to serve the people of America and the people of Canada is an extreme honor. But I can say from you know, and I would say this: we certainly can't do it alone. We get to keep doing the work. We get the license to do the work in the democracy when people are there with us. And you're amazing people. Thank you. Okay, we'll just keep sharing it. Uh, thank you so much for your heartfelt comments. I don't know if you guys saw the New York Times article on Connie Chung and the generation of Connies. And it was uh, basically, of course, a legendary newscaster, Connie Chung. Uh, there was a generation of young girls who were named Connie. Many of them only discovered one another in college. And that's when many of them started, uh, the, in, this is pre-Facebook, keeping in touch with one another and realized how many Connies there are. So when you talk about representation, when you talk about what is possible, just by being yourselves, but especially in the roles that you're in, uh, it just makes little boys and girls think, hey, I could do that too. That's a phenomenal thing. The murder of Vincent Chin is something that we discussed a little bit earlier, and its effects still reverberate today. Uh, it in part stemmed from preconceived notions of disloyalty, something that we're seeing today in both the U.S. and Canada as relations with China have changed. How can the United States and Canada compete with China in a way that does not fuel anti-Asian sentiment back home? of 
us. That is something we have got to take head on. But the problem is not about Chineseness or Asianness. It is not about the Chinese people or Asian culture or heritage. And the reason why we have to bring that kind of discipline is because one, we have legitimate challenges that are that are significant. And second, we have to be able to address those challenges. If we are sloppy or lazy in the way that we approach addressing those challenges, what we stand to do is an incredible amount of damage to our fellow citizens and to our democracy. And so I think that especially working in trade, where we are at the center of a lot of the economic pressures and challenges, this is part of the reason for our intense focus on reorienting the way that we do trade to make sure that we are putting the interests of America's workers at the center, all of America's workers. Because I think that um, uh, every time we lose the focus on our trade and economic policies being here to build our economy from the bottom up and the middle out, when we lose that focus, we stand to lose the significant parts of the integrity of this American and democratic experiment. So I agree with that. Um, in Canada, um, I've been saying to people that words do matter. And um, when you have narrative that, um, you know, that, that uh, causes aspersions to any community, let alone this little you know, minority community, then people get hurt. We saw that during the pandemic, the rise of the pandemic and, uh, and and it being associated not with the disease itself, but with people um, who may have you know who may look Chinese, which is which would be Asians, caused um, it it caused uh, it caused harm on people. So words really do matter when you call a virus a China virus, and then it flows over into uh, into people then those people get hurt. And um, we saw in Vancouver, so a city in Canada, um, saw an increase in anti-Asian racism by 700%. I just looked at the numbers uh, just recently uh, for the work I was doing yesterday, and even in the last year, it's about 45% over last year, the rise of uh, anti-Asian racism. So it's still there, and two thirds of the victims are women. So, um, and, uh, and in Canada, um, diversity is a fact. We are a multicultural country where a Canadian is a Canadian is a Canadian, but you celebrate the heritage from where you, you know, your heritage. So whether you're Indian or, 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 or Japanese or Chinese or, um, or uh, you know, Pakistani or, you know, European, it doesn't matter. You, we celebrate each other's heritages um, in this multicultural fabric that is uh, that is Canada. And I think for people like me, but it isn't just people like me uh, who have a public podium to speak about, you have to be able to stand up against it and you have to call out hate. But then what you do and what I hope we have uh, been able to do as a government is to, is, is, is to do that at all the leadership levels. So I call it out, the Prime Minister calls it out so that we won't stand for hate. But what we also do is we work with um, allies um, across the country in business, unions, not-for-profit groups, civil society groups to stand together because hate is hate. And what I found, what I saw in terms of the most um, awful parts of anti-Asian racism, I also saw the very best of humanity at the same time which was the coming together of people as allies. Um, businesses, I remember convening, and, and that group today exists, and they are still doing this work, pulling people together in Canada to, um, to, uh, to work together, no different than the organizations that are here today, to really both, on the one hand, stand up against hate, but to pull communities together so that you can do this kind of multi- faith and multicultural 
um, uh, collaboration. So it's businesses who I, at the beginning of the pandemic, was quite worried that they may not um, have employees who may look like us in the front parts of their businesses and they would be relegated to the back offices, right? Um, it was um, and convening, you know, convening business leaders in Canada so that they understood, so that it became conscious for them. And when it became conscious, we became collaborators together. Um, the government of Canada also um, has invested $11 million, for example, um, towards anti-Asian racism out of two budgets ago to support groups in Canada um, that would then develop capacity and capability at the community level to work across uh, communities in order to tackle the various issues um, around um, hate, but also inclusiveness. Um, it's convening those allies. Um, I remember having a roundtable conversation with um, the Montreal Chinatown group and said that uh, the seniors were worried about getting out on the street and that citizens were worried about getting out uh, and just, you know, sort of doing their day to day. And we were able to convene the chiefs of police in sort of law enforcement of jurisdiction to be able to bring them in so that we can all actually be building together uh, the solution together. There is a lot of work that still needs to be done. Um, yesterday in uh, Vancouver, I announced um, the federal government's uh, commitment um, or uh, funding towards um, Canada's first ever Chinese Canadian history museum. And, and the reason it's important is because we talked about the journey across the Pacific to both the US and Canada by immigrants in the Pacific. And the journey in the 1800s that, uh, that was in response to the gold rush here in the US, a uh, similar one in Canada, but the extreme discrimination that they faced, the laws and the policies that were put together by both of our respective governments that led to exclusion of Chinese, Canadians, and Americans at the time, it led to the, you know, it, 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 and, and we we come from this 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 dark history um, where where both countries also interned Japanese Canadians and Americans at a time, but what actually became the solution? It was people. People came together. Allies finding other allies. At that time, it was um, not accepting Chinese Canadians not accepting these exclusionary laws that were discriminating of them. And they went to sympathetic politicians, to labor unions, to other people in the communities, to the to, and as a way of being able to fight, it took until 1947 to repeal that law. But that law did get repealed. And what's the moral of the story? The one where Catherine and I started out with, and that Jim also made the appeal to. Every single one of you, and every single one of your friends and neighbors who may feel in the same way have a voice, your voice and your action counts and matters, and it is through that participation, it is actually through that participation that can change policies, that can change laws, and that can create the country and the community and the neighborhood that you want, that we want, that we want together. Do you remember those Canadian Heritage Moment ads growing up? Absolutely, it's the stamp. It's the it, and, and and it was wonderful because it appeared everywhere, and they would teach you yeah. those moments, and it was it was wonderful. Now I'm just trying to remember yeah. what was the latest one that I saw. Well, I just remember the one in, in what you were talking about uh, about the railroad and how the railroad was built in Canada. That was my first time understanding the toll that had been taken and paid for by Chinese Canadians uh, in making that railroad. Uh, so the history matters. Knowing about your heritage, knowing about uh, you know where your family has come from, those things do make a difference. Uh, real quick, when it comes to identity, you know, as a Canadian, we always used to say growing up, Canadian meant white people, and then everybody else was like, where are you from? It took me a very long time to adopt an understanding of myself as an Indian woman. It was always Canadian first and foremost, and of course, that's where I'm from. But even identity, even how I perceive myself, it has been quite a journey to get to that point. But uh, leaders like yourselves make it so much easier to accept and embrace. Who Maybe you are. on that point yeah. about uh, the heritage moments.
The Heritage Moments are created by Heritage Canada, just like the work that Catherine co-chairs as well. When you have administrations and governments who intentionally both invest and put policies and leaders to do the work that Catherine and I get the opportunity to do, that is, that is where governments matter and can matter. Um, so the Heritage Moments is great, but it actually is, you know, it, it is an intentional, purposeful um, piece of work that, uh, that the Government of Canada undertakes. And you both are living history right now, right? I just want to say, I feel very left out in this uh, <laughs> conversation. <laughs> they were really nice ads, they were like two minutes long, and they told us about history. I've gathered, can we talk about Degrassi Jr. High? Oh, yeah. Yes, <laughs> that's the one piece See, of the I knew we were going to get a little long. culture that yeah. like, I can't participate in. <laughs> but you're talking the OG Degrassi, right? Not the one with Drake. That's correct. Yeah, the OG. <laughs> okay, <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, well, both of you are also here for the Asian Pacific Economic uh, Corporation meeting, which the United States is hosting this year. How are you both ensuring that the benefits of trade are available to everyone, particularly underrepresented communities here in the U.S. and in Canada? Yes, this is a great question. So um, the theme for uh, our host year and the ministerial that uh, I get the chance to host here in Detroit is an, uh, let me make sure, a resilient and sustainable economy for all. And that theme of resilient, sustainability, and inclusiveness keeps coming up. And the, the circuit of meetings uh, and ministerials that Mary and I participate in, in talking to people who have the jobs that we have from around the world, top of mind for everyone who is responsible for economic policy in their governments and for this outward-facing international piece of economic policy is, uh, how do we apply the lessons from these past couple of years? Uh, how can we work together to build a more resilient economy for ourselves, a more resilient global economy, one that is more sustainable, where we have more confidence in the long runway ahead of us, that we are building an economy that is going to be growing and prosperous and bright for our kids and their kids, and then also this inclusivity, making sure that uh, the benefits of our economic policies are much more broadly shared. So um, in uh, this respect, um, what I really want to highlight is uh, in early days, the first year of uh, my becoming trade representative, I asked a sister agency of ours, an independent agency, largely run by economists and some lawyers, the International Trade Commission, um, to um, conduct an investigation and write a report for us looking at what have been the distributional effects of our trade policies going back for many years. Because we've long suspected that the distributional impacts have been really uneven. But we've actually never asked the question as a government in an organized way. And what the ITC uh, produced back for us last year in their report was, number one, um, we're not collecting the kind of data we're not asking the questions in a systematic way that would give us a very granular understanding. Nevertheless, based on the data that we do have, based on studies that have been conducted, what the ITC told us is the distributional impacts have been very uneven. Who has not benefited as much from trade? Who actually might have been harmed by our trade policies? There are communities of color, there are women, there are women of color, and then I also really want to highlight because this part doesn't get picked up very often. Also, white, non-college educated men. And I think that in terms of our ethos of inclusivity, of bringing a new approach to trade, to ensure that those impacts and those benefits are more broadly shared, those are the allies, those are the ones, the small companies also, small business is part of your jurisdiction, to ensure that we are expanding access to opportunity. That's what governments should be doing. And that is, the, that is the core of the building the economy from the bottom up and the middle out. If you hear President Biden talk about this, he does it quite a lot. Um, it's, uh, the vision is the opposite of top down. So what you do is you, you focus on creating opportunities for those at the bottom to give them a pathway to moving into the middle. And then you try to expand the middle class as broadly as you can because a strong middle class makes for a strong country. 
And that's the vision. So it is going to require us to rethink trade significantly. And we need partners to do that because you can't trade with yourself. So um, uh, consistently through our work, through forums like the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation, I am out here looking for allies, building relationships so that we can innovate in the area of trade and start looking for uh, ways to promote economic policies that um, create resilience, sustainability, and that all important inclusivity. Well, I'll dive into one specific piece that uh, is about Canada and the United States. When we renegotiated our new trade agreement between Canada, the United States, and Mexico, there was a really terrific chapter that was put in. And it was for greater, greater collaborative work between our countries on small, medium-sized businesses. Now, in Canada, I do have both sides of the job. I have, um, I'm the Minister of Trade, but I'm also the Minister responsible for small businesses and economic development. Prime Minister Trudeau put this portfolio together in this way because in Canada, 99% of our businesses are small and medium-sized businesses. And, uh, and we are, we're 38 million people, we're like the size of California in population, but we are the 10th largest economy in the world. Our largest trading partner is with the United States, but again, it's about making sure that trade is inclusive and that the benefits of trade yield to all people in our society so that these small businesses, women-led, women-owned businesses, which by nature are small, um, black-owned businesses, minority-owned businesses, LGBTQ2-owned businesses, that they are getting the benefit of growth and growth through trade. So, if I think about uh, the Free Trade Commission that um, Catherine and I um, in Mexico, we host this every single year to take a look at how our trade relationship is working. One of the most exciting things we did last year was we actually had a women-led trade mission complement our the work that we were doing as government. So we had this wonderful delegation of women in trade from all three countries come uh, to the Free Trade Commission to work actually to do business in parallel to our work as government. That is deliberate architecture from our standpoint. And I'll end it with this. In Canada, I also lead the Women's Entrepreneurship Strategy. It is, um, it is a seven, it, almost $7 billion uh, program now. It has three parts. One, helping women entrepreneurs get access to capital. Second, creating an ecosystem of support that includes business training, mentorship, access to business networks. And the third part that is about measuring and data. It, in Canada, you, we can add $150 billion to our economy by one thing, adding women to the economy. And globally, if we do that, it's $12 trillion. And, but economic policy alone won't do it. $10 a day early learning and childcare is what we've implemented in Canada and parental leave. So when you can create, you know, some would say it's social policy, it's economic policy. It's smart, progressive policies that bet on people, it bets on the middle class, and it intentionally creates policies and architecture that helps those that are working, those that are in the middle class, or those working hard to join the middle class, become the middle class and create growth and prosperity in our country. And it is, it is, it is building these relationships and, uh, and, 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 and more on, um, you know, on this sort of premise of, uh, of these values that we just talked about. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Can we give a round warm applause for Ambassador Tai and Minister Ng uh, talking about trade, talking about this important relationship between the U.S. and Canada. Thank you so much. Representation matters, and we are all lucky to have you in this important role. Thank you so much. Can we give them another round of applause, please?